Welcome back everyone. Today, we are diving into a new world where our protagonist becomes a part-time dragon and manages his full-time harem. On the eve of the year 2076, the boundary between reality and fantasy blurred as a game-like scenario descended upon the world. The arrival of countless perilous dungeons, teeming with hordes of monsters, marked the beginning of an unprecedented crisis. Powerful beings mercilessly decimated the human population, pushing humanity to the verge of extinction. Amidst the chaos, divine talents were bestowed upon select individuals, enabling them to awaken as formidable hunters. These hunters eventually turned the tide rescuing the world from the monstrous onslaught and ushering in a new era where strength ruled supreme, and survival of the fittest became the undisputed law. Hunters were thus compelled to constantly enhance their abilities to maintain their positions in this newly established order. In their quest for dominance, these hunters ventured into the depths of various dungeons, confronting formidable bosses, securing treasures, and advancing their levels. This relentless pursuit of power and wealth signified the dawn of the era of global hunters. During this era, the establishment of the Hunter Square marked a significant development. This grandiose structure, renowned for its imposing height and the aura it radiated, presented a preliminary challenge to those who sought to embark on a pivotal journey within society. To gain entry, individuals were required to ascend a thousand steps, a symbolic trial preceding the awakening of their hunter class. Successfully entering the hunter square allowed them the opportunity to awaken their potential and commence their path as esteemed members of the community. However, not every hunter hits the jackpot, and Su Yong is a perfect example. Walking down the grand staircase of the hunter square, he couldn't help but feel disappointed. He had hoped for a special or rare class, but ended up as a warrior, the most basic kind you can get. His stats weren't anything to brag about either, with his strength at 12 only, and both speed and spirit as at 10. When warriors like him doesn't have a great start, they often find themselves at a disadvantage in close quarters combat and face a higher risk of injury or death. Despite investing considerable time and effort into their training, warriors like Su Yong often feel their contributions are overshadowed by those with more specialized abilities. As Su Yong was trying to wrap his head around becoming a basic warrior, a useless shit who has nothing better to do than strut around with parasites on his back decided to approach Su Yong and start throwing shades at him, as he had heard how Su Yong had just awakened as a warrior, and that he should be happy since it is what he deserves. A nobody orphan who couldn't afford a clue, let alone a spot in any respectable guild basically, calling him the perfect candidate for grunt work. But Su Yong having none of it hits him with a quick clap back, literally clapping his hands like he's trying to catch a fly that aren't there, stopping Wang Fei from yapping. And then he pretended to congratulate him on becoming an ice mage, a class as rare as a good hair day for Wang Fei. While sneakily dicing how mages turn into glass cannons after their awakening. Strong in magic, but as sturdy as a wet paper bag in a fight. So if he's so courageous to provoke him, he should run them hands, because he would gladly give him the smoke if he desperately wants to. But as Su Yong expected, Wang Fei can only muster up some weak threats while hiding behind his squad instead of squaring up to him like a man. And in the midst of an escalating standoff, the air was thick with anticipation as everyone braced for what seemed to be an inevitable clash. However, the dynamic shifted dramatically when one of the members of Wang Fei's group caught sight of something that instantly demanded everyone's attention. Turning their heads, the crowd was taken aback to find themselves in the presence of the Spirit Hunt Guild's raiding team. This wasn't just any guild, but an A-tier powerhouse known throughout East Spirit City for its formidable achievements and influence. The crowd's initial shock quickly morphed into excitement as they recognized Zhao Ming, the vice president of the Spirit Hunt Guild. Zhao Ming, a figure usually seen gracing the guild's posters and promotional material, stood there in the flesh, his presence commanding the space around him. Seizing the moment, Wang Fei stepped forward with a mix of eagerness and ambition. He approached the raiding team, full of praise for the Spirit Hunt Guild, and openly expressing his desire to become a part of their ranks. Notes he didn't hold back in showcasing his rare Ice Mage profession, hoping to impress and secure a spot in the guild. Initially, his request was declined by another guild member of the Spirit Hunt Guild, stopping his advancement and redirected him to apply at their recruitment crew down the stairs. However, Zhao Ming respects the hustle that Wang Fei had just demonstrated, and the strategic advantage his control skill could bring to the guild. And so, he decided to give Wang Fei a recruitment card. 
This gesture not only highlighted Wang Fei's potential value to the guild, but also served as a testament to the Spirit Hunt Guild's openness to scouting and embracing new talent. Witnessing this interaction, others in the vicinity were quick to jump on the bandwagon. They began voicing their own aspirations to join the Spirit Hunt Guild, each citing their unique professions and abilities in hopes of catching the raiding team's attention. However, the raiding team made it abundantly clear that their current mission was not centered on recruitment. They advised all hopefuls to follow the guild's official recruitment process, emphasizing that proper channels and procedures needed to be adhered to. Their response was delivered with the kind of efficiency and professionalism that left no room for further discussion or negotiation. But before they could leave, Su Yong asked if they are also interested about warriors. But he was only met with disdain, as if he just asked a stupid question and wasted their time to even consider talking to a warrior. This encounter, brief as it may have been, left a lasting impression on everyone present. It showcased the prestige and selectiveness of the Spirit Hunt Guild, while also highlighting the competitive nature of the world they inhabited. And for Su Yong, this was yet another reminder of the challenges that lay ahead. There was definitely an isolation treatment for warriors like him. And it seemed to garner no interest from the elite guild. In a world where strength and the rarity of one's profession determined one's future, Suyang couldn't help but feel that his fate was already sealed. Given the general reluctance of even lower tier guilds to accept warriors, but as he was in deep thought, Suyang overheard why the vice president of Spirit Hunt Guild was here in the first place. And it was because they are actually planning to raid the Black Dragon's lair today and they are using the teleportation gate inside the hunter square to get to the entrance of the dungeon. This was a surprise to you, Su Yong, because the Black Dragon's lair is the largest S-tier dungeon in City C. It not only has numerous small monsters, but it is also filled with powerful elite creatures. Even though death in this world doesn't mean immediate demise, instead, one loses levels in experience until one level drops to zero. The heavy competition between top guild is at all-time high, so the risk of losing a level and rare equipment should really be considered. There is also the most terrifying boss that awaits in the Black Dragon's lair, the level 99 Black Flame Wings Athos. And Suying had heard that even the strongest S-ranked guilds have fallen at its feet, but they say the Spirit Hunt Guild has a large number of hunters at 4th Transcendence or higher. And they've never failed a raid, so Suying assumed that maybe they really can do it. But thinking about what others will accomplish really bummed him out, thinking the harsh reality that he may be destined to be a pauper in this life. Trampled under the feet of these powerful beings. But before despair could fully take hold of him, Su Yan was startled by a sudden notification, lifting his gaze. He was met with a system interface proclaiming him a perfect soul host, indicating that the part-time system would soon be bound to him. The revelation was astonishing, but nothing prepared him for what came next. A notification asked him to activate the role. Su Yang confirmed, yes, new notification popped confirming the initiation of jump. Upon reopening his eyes, Su Yang found himself transformed into the level 99 Black Dragon, Athos, Black Flame Wing. His new form boasted an incredible health pool of 5 million, alongside staggering strength, speed, and spirit values. He was even equipped with talents that seemed straight out of a legend. The dragon bloodline gave him an incredible advantage, making him nearly impervious to both physical and magical attacks with an 80% immunity. His innate mastery over the destructive black flames allowed him to unleash powerful fire-based attacks without any cost, dealing massive magical damage to his adversaries. Not to mention, his dragon suppression ability, which lowered the attributes of any creature below his level by 20%, giving him an overwhelming edge in battles. Moreover, his arsenal of skills was nothing short of awe-inspiring. The Dragon Blast could inflict damage equal to 300% of his strength, while his Dragon's Roar had the power to stun all beings within a 300-meter radius. With lower spirit values than his for 5 seconds, the Dragon's Eyes skill granted him the ability to survey any area within his domain without needing direct line of sight. Adding an element of omnipresence within his territory, the realization of his capabilities left Suying in a state of shock and disbelief. Unlike a typical level 99 player who might excel in one attribute, the Black Flame Dragon's attributes were off the charts. With over 3000 in strength alone, 
Coupled with his resistances and unique skills, Su Ying felt an unparalleled sense of power coursing through him. A feeling so exhilarating that he couldn't help but release a mighty roar. A primal expression of his newfound might, despite knowing that his transformation into Othos, the Black Dragon, was temporary. The thrill of experiencing such power was intoxicating. He understood that if he could leverage this power to defeat other players, the experience and strength gained could be transferred to his original body. This realization filled him with excitement and determination. Even if his original form was considered the least desirable among professions, this opportunity could catapult him to new heights. Allowing him to level up rapidly and redefine his destiny in this world dominated by the strong. In the midst of his awe, however, Su Yang noticed the monsters in front of him were clearly affected by something. On closer inspection, he realized they were reeling from the after-effects of his Dragon Roar skill, which he had unleashed unintentionally. Among them, a hooded figure stood out, addressing him as king and begging for mercy. It dawned on Su Yang that these monsters recognized him as their leader, presumably because he was currently embodying the Black Dragon. And so, he acted what he assumed a superior being would do. Look down at his subordinates as inferior beings, and command them to rise as he no longer uses his roar. After that, the hooded monster praises him for having such power even at this early stage. And if he reaches maturity, he would undoubtedly crush the human world. With this, Suying was reminded that the dragon he possessed right now is just at the juvenile stage. And this is surprising since everyone knows that a boss in an instance have fixed level. But it seems like it wasn't the case for this black dragon, for its title suggested that he has a chance to gain level. This revelation piqued Suying's interest, but his attention soon shifted to a captivating sight. A beautiful elf imprisoned within a cage. Her elegant silver hair and striking crimson eyes contrasted sharply with her distressed state, struggling to breathe under the influence of Su Yang's dragon aura. When she noticed his gaze, she demanded her release, threatening retribution from the elven race. However, Su Yang was more fascinated than intimidated, since the merging of the game world with reality, various mythical races had emerged, and elves, known for their seclusion within instances, were among them. Seeing an elf was rare, and Su Yang was captivated by the opportunity to interact with one firsthand. However, their conversation was cut short by the sudden ripple of a spatial disturbance. A sign that a player was about to enter the scene. The elf, interpreting this as the arrival of a savior, openly taunted the dragon, believing her freedom was imminent. She was taken aback when the dragon, whom she expected to ignore her jibes, turned its attention towards her. This unusual behavior puzzled her, as dragons typically disregarded such provocations. However, Su Yang had more pressing concerns than engaging in banter with the elf. He was aware that the Spirit Hunt Guild was on its way, and despite their reputation for unbeaten strategies, Su Yang doubted their ability to overcome him in his current formidable state. Still, he reminded himself not to underestimate his opponents. Overconfidence could lead to defeat, and the Spirit Hunt Guild wouldn't dare face him without a solid plan. To get a better understanding of the guild's approach, Su Yang activated his Dragon's Eye ability, allowing him to oversee the guild's movements from afar. He quickly spotted the guild's main assault team, led by Lei Shan, a level 99 Thunderstorm Master. Accompanying Lei Shan were the guild's elite members, Zhao Ming, a level 95 Storm Archer, Chen Yuan, a level 96 Healing Paladin, and Li Dan, the level 98 Holy Shield Master. They were all marching towards his lair with a single goal in mind, to defeat the Black Dragon Othos and elevate their guild status to the fifth stage of transformation. Su Yang couldn't help but respect their boldness. Yet, he was curious to see how long their confidence would hold up against his minions. Thus, the guild's advance was soon challenged by a swarm of flying magic wyverns. But Lei Shan, who was completely unfazed by these lesser creatures, calmly ordered his tanks to lead the charge, while the rest of the guild used fire attacks to maximize their output, which his guild members followed thoroughly. And with this, they completely dispatched the wyverns effortlessly without halting their march. Meanwhile, Su Yang was duly impressed by the Spirit Hunt Guild's prowess and coordination, recognizing them as the formidable force they were known to be. Realizing that his lesser minions had barely made the guild break a sweat, Su Yang decided it was time to up the ante. 
he summoned a dragon warrior, a behemoth that towered over the battlefield, causing even the seasoned members of the Spirit Hunt Guild to freeze momentarily in awe and apprehension. Even Lation wasn't an exception. He was momentarily taken aback by the dragon warrior's sudden appearance and impressive capabilities. Still, he quickly organized his guild for defense. The dragon warrior, matching even the guild's elite and strength, presented a new level of threat with its ability to teleport short distances. Catching the guild off guard and nearly overwhelming their DPS units. In a critical moment, Li Dan activated his divine light shield barrier, thwarting the dragon warrior's assault and protecting his fellow guild members. While Zhao Ming seized control in the chaos, ordering the ranged attackers to retreat and the melee fighters to engage, his strategic use of the storm arrow skill was pivotal. Taking down the elite dragon warrior and demonstrating the guild's resilience and strategic flexibility in the face of unexpected challenges. Despite the Spirit Hunt Guild's success, Su Yang remained composed. This just proved to him that an elite monster of that level could definitely challenge the guild. The elf on the other hand, tried to mock him again for even attempting to send his lackeys to do his bidding just to die like that. Little did she knew, he had a few more of those elite for him to command. Completely surprising the elf yet again, as Su Yang released six more elite dragons into the fray. The guild faced an unprecedented situation. Scaring all the members of the guild, even their elite units didn't know what to do, as there were no records that the dragon would send units after them even before encountering it. So it was definitely strange occurrence. Still, Lation remained calm, because to him, they are all but just elite monsters, and he specialized on dealing with elites, and so with his leadership alone. He is confident that they could overcome this. And due to their trust and respect to their leader, the guild members steal their resolve and listen. And Leishan then commanded to reform their ranks, prioritize healing the tanks, as they would maintain aggro until the battle ends. Combining this tactic with their raw power, they managed to overpower the new threats. Meanwhile, Su Ying watched and was surprised by the outcome. Initially, he thought that using elite monsters and catching them by surprise would be enough to drive them away, but it seems like it wasn't the case. They are more tenacious than he thought, but still, he can't really understand why they are so eager to challenge him. It was no doubt they are strong, but they aren't strong enough to defeat him yet, and even the elite monsters that he sent made them struggle. Unless they have an unused cards that will turn the tides in their favor. But as he was in deep thought, he was surprised to notice that the guild had decided to go to the other direction. This was such an unexpected thing, as they are just few steps away before they meet him. This prompted him to assume that there must be some secrets hidden in the direction the guild was heading, utilizing his dragon vision. He discovered they were heading towards the dragon slayer's tomb. Inside it, there was a glowing item that caught his attention. It was the dragon slayer's heart a quest item capable of negating dragon talents. Following the threat this posed, a surge of rage overtook Su Ying, and his subordinates was startled yet again, asking him if he was okay. But he couldn't care less what they asked, as his mind was more preoccupied of the fact that, what's happening right now is just like the strategies and what happens in games. Where a boss with almost invincible resistance was weakened by the players through certain mechanism or items. And if that item allows player ignore his talent, then there is indeed a possibility that he will be defeated. But now that he knows this, he wouldn't just stand and wait for them to acquire this item. And so, with a powerful flap of his wing, he left his lair. The sight of him taking first really made the monsters rally in excitement. Their king taking action could only mean victory, so they cheered as he leaves. And even the elf was taken aback by this sudden change of attitude of the dragon because the dragon usually wait for adventurers to get near his lair, and never leaves early. And the way that it reacts was much more concerning, as if the dragon was in a rage, leaving the area with intense speed, breaking the sound barrier, and creating a shockwave that even the ground collapsed. Meanwhile, as the Spirit Hunt Guild continued their march through the instance, Lation expressed frustration at the unexpected challenges they had encountered since entering. This wasn't in the guide that were given to them. Hearing this, Zhao Ming speculated that the heavenly mechanism pavilion that gave them their guide might have deceived them. Leishan, however, remained confident in the pavilion's reputation and the authenticity of their strategy. 
especially when he had exchanged this strategy using his universe ring, which Zhao Ming understood, so he dropped the subject. But since there were too many uncertainties that happened in this raid, Qingmen raised concerns about potentially alerting the Black Dragon if they faced another unexpected situation. To which Lation dismissed these worries, since the Black Dragon is just a boss in an instance with power, and it's complacent as the guide had stated, it is but a lazy overpowered lizard. As long as they don't initiate an attack, he is confident that it won't leave its lair. And they really shouldn't worry. This dragon is just a stepping stone for their guild. And now that it has caused so much damage to their guild, he promises to take it all back from it. Chen Yuan, on the other hand, was enticed by other things, because as long as they complete Elf Maiden's Easter Egg, not only they can obtain a pass to the Elven Kingdom, but the Elf Maiden will also obey their commands, and Lei Shan quite understand the needs of his men. So he promises to have the authority with the Elf, as long as they defeat the dragon first. But their planning was abruptly interrupted when Qian Yuan spotted a large silhouette in the sky. Initially, they had mistaken it for a small flying dragon monster, which wasn't a threat by any means. But still, this was yet another unexpected thing to happen, because flying dragons are labeled as guard monsters. Therefore, there is no reason for them to appear here. But as soon as the silhouette got close, it also got larger, and now they wish it was just a simple guard monster. Unfortunately for them, it wasn't the case. As the true identity of the silhouette became apparent, it was the Wing of Black Flame. The boss they were supposed to confront later in their quest. Shock filled everyone's face. But one thing was in their mind. Those bastards from the Heavenly Pavilion had truly deceived them. Faced with the sudden appearance of the Black Dragon without the Dragonslayer's heart, which they believed was essential for their victory, the guild contemplated retreat. And seeing them cower only made Su Yang smirk as the supposedly invincible Spirit Hunt Guild was just a coward all along without their tricks. But even still, this was in favor for him, so he decided to eliminate them and level up in one go. However, Lation's resolve hardened as he witnessed the dragon preparing to attack. And so, before the dragon could release his skill, he quickly used his lightning ability. Although it wasn't the most powerful attack, it successfully interrupted the dragon's assault. Lishan then radiated a powerful aura of electricity, signaling his determination to confront the dragon head-on, and he firmly instructed his guild that retreat was not an option. As he believed in everyone's ability, and there is nothing they can achieve. Though this dragon is strong, his guild members are strong as well, so they should get back to their position and get ready to slay this dragon, and if that's not enough to convince them. He promised to reward them generously. May it be money, equipment, or women. There are no such thing as impossible after they overcome this. With this, Lishan had gained back everyone's spirit. Even though the dragon was still looking menacing as before, they believed in the captain's words, and now believe they could overcome everything. Meanwhile, Su Yang was equally excited on what this renowned guild may show him. As the confrontation with the formidable dragon ATOS escalated, Li Shen swiftly issued commands to bolster their defenses and offensive capabilities. He instructed Li Dan to activate the strongest defense barrier and called upon the healers to support him with mana regeneration, aiming to sustain their position. Meanwhile, the support classes apply all single target buffs on him and Zhao Ming to maximize their output, as they just have to make an opening even for a little bit, because according to the guide, they are not far from the Dragonslayer's tomb. So, as long as they manage to open a fraction of a second of opportunity, there is still hope for them to defeat this dragon. However, their planning was abruptly cut short when Atosa's tail crashed down among them, causing chaos and destruction. Since Su Yang was determined not to allow the guild any time to execute their plans, he but to his surprise, amidst the settling debris and smoke. A light flicker and magic attacks came to his face soon after. It seems like the players were still alive, and it was all because of Li Dan, setting up his triple holy light barrier on the nick of time. It was uncharacteristic of a boss to make the move first, so they didn't expect this to happen. But since a boss can only use one skill at a time, they have the opportunity to retaliate, and therefore Qian Yuan invoked a divine blessing to enhance their holy light skills. While others follow suit with this, 
Lei Shan and Zhao Ming were enhanced with buffs, and has maximized their potential, preparing to unleash their full might against the dragon. Meanwhile, Su Yang acknowledged the execution power of an A-plus level guild, they just got caught by surprise, but in an instant, they were able to ready themselves to counter. Making it late for him to even dodge. And therefore he just focuses on the defense, just in case. With that, the two had released their most devastating blows all at once. Mixing all their most potent skills to make one highly concentrated attack to Othos, that its impact was visible far beyond the immediate battlefield. And Laishan was confident that they at least managed to lessen Ado's health by 5%. So he commanded his guild to prepare another attack, but to his surprise, as the smoke dissipates, he was in shock to see that the guild's most potent attacks barely scratched Ado's. Dealing a meager 10,000 damage. It wasn't even at 1%, showing to them how powerful the dragon's reduction rate was. With this, the others were thinking of retreating. But Lei Shan urged his guild to persist, since the dragon's health hasn't dropped to 75%, so it won't release its skills anymore. Therefore, they still have a chance to distract it and get the artifact, and so they continued. However, Su Yang was growing impatient with the guild's tenacity. They are just like a swarm of mosquitoes now. Their attacks can't even damage him anymore. And what's worse is that they still seem to grasp on hope. But he can't just entertain them for this long. And so he decided to end their resistance with a devastating dragon roar, that even the ground that he was standing on had crumbled. While the guild members received the full-on blast of its devastating power, they lay flat on the ground defeated. Only Ito's remains standing proud, as it seems like even an A-level guild is not matched for him. In the aftermath of Ito's devastating dragon roar, Leishin, struggling to remain conscious, was confounded by the dragon's use of such a powerful skill. Unexpectedly, the guide had failed them once more, providing false hope and strategies. Despite this setback, Leishin's spirit was unbroken. He urged his guild members to regroup and launch another attack, clinging to the belief that Ito's would be momentarily vulnerable after using its roar. But as he surveyed the battlefield, Leishin's heart sank, as his guild members was already incapacitated, sprawled helplessly across the ground. Even the guild's strongest fighters had been overwhelmed by Edos's formidable power. But what really broke his spirit was the dragon he thought was paralyzed, was far from immobilized. Contrary to their guide's information, the dragon was on the move, ready to strike again. Without warning, Edos unleashed a dragon's breath, a skill even more destructive than what they had made, laying waste to what remained of their defenses. The breath's sheer force and intensity were beyond anything they had anticipated or could withstand, while Lation could do nothing but curse at this damn dragon. And promised to return this favor a hundred times more. After that, a system interface popped up. Since the intruders had been completely eliminated, the distribution of experience would now commence. And to his surprise, the amount of XP was overwhelming. But it was to be expected since he just eliminated a guild that consists of high-level players, ranging from level 80 to 99. In turn, leveling up won't stop, and he could even see that he is overflowing with experience. He accumulated 990,000 points that propelled him from level 1 to 20. Reaching the level cap of the first transformation, and due to the experience, overflow 40% of it was lost. So, currently, his remaining experience reserve is now at 430,000. But it's still huge, and this meant that his level can continue to skyrocket after he job change. He might even reach level 40 of the second transformation today. This is simply terrifying and exciting to him. Furthermore, he has 200 unallocated attribute points, so he was thinking of coming back to his original form as soon as possible. But before he could, Su Young noticed the battlefield was littered with shimmering lights. A clear sign of equipment drops from the high-level players he had just defeated. Excited by the prospect of acquiring rare items, he eagerly collected them, expecting gold tier gear at most. However, to his astonishment, among the loot were items of even higher rarity. A diamond tier longbow, accessory, and cloud flow boots, along with a platinum tier staff, and a flame greatsword. These finds exceeded his expectations, particularly the longbow, which he recognized as Zhao Ming's. The vice president of the Spirit Hunt Guild, Su Yong, 
found amusement in the thought of Zhao Ning's reaction to losing such a prized item. Despite being a warrior, and unable to use some of the equipment, he knew their value on the black market could net him a substantial profit. In addition to the weapons and armor, Su Yong discovered a variety of potions and premium skill scrolls capable of boosting his abilities. But what excites him even more is that among these treasures was a broken boundless gem, an exceptional item that could remove level restrictions from equipment. This gem was particularly exciting for Su Yong, as it would allow him to wield equipment like the Platinum Tier Greatsword, which typically required one to be level 79. This weapon was not only a perfect match for his warrior class, but also boasted incredible attributes. Including an enchantment that added flame damage to his attacks and the ability to summon a flame giant. Albeit with a one-day cooldown. This is such a strong weapon to have, so as soon as the system had notified Suyong that he could now return to his original form, he didn't hesitate to go back. Instantly, light enveloped Suyong's dragon form, and in the next moment, he found himself back in his human form. Surprisingly, right at home, he had expected to return to the location he was at before the transformation, but it appeared the system had a more convenient approach. But that's not really what matters. The most important thing is that he was now level 20, and what happened was not a dream. And with this, Su Yong went straight ahead and allocate his points, putting 100 on strength and 50 each to speed and spirit. Although warriors usually don't add spirit, with the advantage he has for receiving a system, he can't just follow the usual path, and he had obtained scrolls. Which has a minimum required spirit for him to use. But to his surprise, the moment he confirmed the distribution of his points, an overwhelming aura burst forth from him. It was as if the very essence of his being had been supercharged, unleashing a wave of power that resonated throughout the room. This sudden manifestation of strength was so intense that it sent a shockwave through his belongings, leaving a trail of disarray in its wake. The experience served as a stark reminder of the raw power he now commanded, prompting a mental note to not to overdo it in the future. Now that was settled, the next thing he should do is to go to the temple to make a job change, but as he get a look at the time he realized that it's already too late for him to do that today. So it seems like he has no choice but to rest for now and just go to the temple tomorrow and take the transfer quest, which really excite him as he looks forward to complete his job change. Back at the Spirit Hunt Guild headquarters, the return of their leader so quickly stirred a wave of shock among the members. They understood that his early return signified one of two things. Either they had swiftly vanquished the dragon or faced a crushing defeat. The latter became apparent as they observed their leader's diminished state, noting the drop in his level from 99 to 90, a sight they had never before witnessed. The guild had always prided itself on its invincibility, bolstered by their strategies, and they also have the guide from the Heavenly Mechanism Pavilion. So there was no chance that they could be defeated, but this just pissed the leader even more, and commanded them not to mention that backstabbing of a pavilion in front of his face ever again. He had traded his universe ring, and but they just gave him a shit strategy that led them to their defeat. This is unforgivable, and his men had also taken an impact, especially his vice president, Zhao Ming, who not only had dropped his level to 86, but he has also lost his diamond tear weapon. Which took a toll on a mental health. Even his priest is now having a tantrum as he had lost not only the boots, but the chance to have himself an elf girlfriend. With this turn of events, Li Shen's eyes sparked with the fury of thunder. A clear sign of the storm that was about to be unleashed as he vowed to seek retribution against the pavilion for their betrayal, and will not rest until he got answer from those deceiving ships. The next day had arrived, and the ancient orphanage was alive with activity. It was a scene unlike any typical day. Kids ran around playing their laughter and shouts filling the air, while the adults were busy with their responsibilities, trying to keep everything under control. This particular day was far more chaotic than usual, because the orphanage received a surprising amount of deliveries. Piles of boxes and packages had arrived, addressed to the orphanage, which puzzled everyone, especially the elderly man in charge. He couldn't help but wonder if there had been some mistake. Thinking perhaps these goods were meant for another place. However, the delivery staff were certain they were at the right location. They showed the paperwork, which clearly stated that these items were to be delivered to the Anshan Orphanage, and the person who ordered them was a young man named Su Yong. This detail shocked the old caretaker. 
He knew Su Yang very well, and was aware that Su Yang didn't have much money. The caretaker couldn't figure out how Su Yang could afford to send so much to the orphanage. But as the caretaker was lost in his thoughts, his attention was suddenly drawn to a more pressing matter. His parental instincts kicked in when he saw a little girl playing dangerously close to a stack of crates. And just as he feared, these crates were tipped over, and the little girl was about to get crushed by it. But, because he was old, he couldn't reach her in time, and all he could do was shout. Fortunately, just as the crates began to fall, a figure rushed forward with remarkable speed, and arms shot out catching and stabilizing the crates in the nick of time. Preventing them from crashing down on the little girl. The rescuer was none other than Su Yong, the same person who had sent all the deliveries. He had arrived just in time to save the day, and it seems like he is well loved by the kids in the orphanage, as they immediately rushed towards him the moment they recognized him. And seeing them lively like this put Su Yang's mind at ease, and the old man was equally excited to greet him. And it seems like Su Yang becomes so powerful, holding the crate like it was nothing, making the old man proud that he had already received a profession. Despite his joy, the caretaker's concern for Su Yang's well-being lingered. It was second nature for him to worry about the children he had raised, prompting him to advise Su Yang to remain cautious and prioritize his safety. Su Yang could only offer an awkward smile in response, fully aware that he was the monster that others should be aware of. Nevertheless, Su Yang was touched by the caretaker's care and concern. Having grown up an orphan, he felt fortunate to have someone who looked out for him like a family member. Eager to ease the caretaker's worries, Su Yang reassured him that he had nothing to fear, since the monster are pretty obedient towards him, and they can't even hurt him. Thanks to his considerable strength, and he's even going to the temple right now to change his professions. That's how strong he was, and this brought a momentary sense of relief to the old man. Shortly after his departure from the orphanage, Su Yang made his way to the profession change hall. Upon arrival, he was immediately caught up in the whirlwind of rumors swirling around the place. The hot topic of the day was the shocking news that the Spirit Hunt Guild had been completely decimated. This disastrous event was traced back to an issue with the Heavenly Mechanism Pavilion's branch, specifically, a fault in the guide they had provided. Known for its meticulous and highly regarded raid groups, was now under scrutiny for a mistake that seemed out of character for such a prestigious organization. As Su Yang mingled among the crowd, absorbing the gossip, he pieced together valuable information. The Heavenly Mechanism Pavilion was not just any raid group. It was a top-tier organization, boasting numerous experts of the fifth tier. The implications were clear, if there were indeed flaws in their raid strategy, the Heavenly Mechanism Pavilion would soon take steps to rectify their mistake, likely leading them directly to Su Yong as their next challenge. But this just put a smile on his face. And the thought of going up against the members of the Heavenly Mechanism Pavilion didn't intimidate him. Instead, it sparked excitement at the prospect of the high-quality equipment he could potentially acquire from them. However, his trains of thought were disrupted yet again by the same fucker who can't mind his own damn business. It was Wang Fei and his group of nobodies. And with Wang Fei's usual arrogance, he questioned why Su Yang still keeps on appearing at the temple when his profession is nothing but trash. And before he could respond, he emphasized that was a rhetorical question, as Wang Fei was well aware why, and that no guild had wanted Su Yang. So he asked to come every day to try his luck. A fact he found amusing. But all jokes aside, since he was now in front of him, it is a good time to continue what they couldn't the day before. He was lucky he lets him off yesterday because of the guild business, but now that his schedule is free and had allocated his points and learned some skills. Why not he demonstrate this newfound abilities and teach him a lesson for crossing him? But unfortunately for Wang Fei, even before he could release his skill, Su Yang decided to act first and cast fist, letting Wang catch his hands with his face. And he smacked him so hard that he practically became a human pinball. And this attack of his knocked Wang Fei's HP down to 5%, nearly killing the dude. Also, this sent a strong message to his band of goons to not mess with him anymore, because if they did, he is free to let them feel his hands like what he did to Wang Fei. A proposition they decidedly weren't keen on, 
prompting them to collect their homeboy, Wang Fei, and make a hasty retreat from the scene. And as they vanished to view, an applause from his rear caught Su Yang's attention. Turning towards it, he was met by the sight of a woman clad in black, her attire nuns, yet the slit in her dress that revealed her thighs suggested she was anything but a nun. Cheer up guys, I think the first thick waifu just appeared. Look at those curves, I mean clothes. Shit. With this, it became immediately clear that she was a temple profession transition guide, a key staff member of the changing hall, and she is really impressed by the prowess Su Yong displayed. Leading her to inquire if there was any way she could assist him, which what Su Yong exactly need. So he expressed his desire for a profession transition, a service she was perfectly positioned to provide. With a welcoming nod, she asked Su Ying to follow her to begin the transition process. During their walk, the guide couldn't help but notice Su Ying's appearance, which suggested he was a newcomer to the world of hunters. As they arrived at their destination, before them stood the transition god statue. An imposing figure carved from marble that dwarfed them in its grandeur. This statue wasn't just a piece of art, it was imbued with magic capable of detecting a person's profession and level, assigning them a transition task based on these criteria. Successfully completing this task was the key to undergoing a profession transition, a critical step for any hunter wishing to advance their skills and status. Speaking about transition tasks, this are categorized into four levels of difficulty. Each designed to test the hunter's capabilities. Before Suyang could begin, the temple guide offered some advice, suggesting he attempt a three-star task. This recommendation piqued Su Yang's interest, leading him to question why not aim for a four-star task. The guide explained that four-star tasks are significantly more challenging. While it might seem a bit harsh, she pointed out that Su Yang's current profession as a warrior comes with its set of challenges, especially since these tasks demand completion solo. Furthermore, she emphasized that transition tasks are not just any ordinary challenges. They are commitments for life. Opting for a four-star task comes with the risk of a lifelong inability to transition should he fail. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Su Young decided to proceed, extending his arm towards the statue to discover his task. A flash of lightning filled the room, a sign that the statue was evaluating his eligibility. Once it confirmed he met the prerequisites, various transition tasks appeared before him, each with its own set of challenges and rewards. The one-star transition task was straightforward, requiring him to defeat 10 level 20 ordinary sharp-toothed boars. Success would grant him the opportunity to choose between becoming a charge warrior or a defense warrior. Progressing to the two-star task, the difficulty slightly increased. Maintaining similar objectives, but with the added reward of a common grade first tier warrior skill book. The complexity further escalated with the three star task, which also promised a superior grade first tier warrior skill book, enriching Su Yang's arsenal. The four star task upped the ante, challenging him to undertake more daunting feats, but offering the prospect of transitioning into a bloodthirsty warlord. Accompanied by a fine grade, first tier warrior skill book, but the most notable of all is that there is option beyond what he was initially informed of a daunting five-star transition task. This task stood out with its unique, ominous background color, and looking at the information closely. It was indeed on a whole another level. It required him to venture into the perilous cold moon forest where he needs to kill 100 level 20 ordinary gray wolves. 10 level 20 elite savage wolves and 1 level 20 boss grade gray wolf. Furthermore, he was restricted from using any equipment or items obtained through gifts or trades, adding to the challenge's intensity. This is beyond overkill, but its rewards justified it, promising a special transition to the Path Demon Warrior, an additional 100 points of spirit attribute. An epic grade first tier Demon Warrior special skill, and the privilege of enjoying certain exclusive temple benefits. This revelation came as a shock to him especially since he was initially informed that only four-star tasks were available, and so he quickly turned around and confronted the nun about it. The nun promptly apologized for the oversight, explaining that the sheer difficulty of the five-star task was the reason for it hadn't been mentioned. It was so difficult that not a single person in the Wa Kingdom has accepted this task for many years. Furthermore, with the advent of the transition era, 
the strength of each country's upper limit is determined by the transitioners. And so, rather than letting potential professionals remain stuck at level 20 forever due to a wrong choice, both the country and the temple advise against attempting the five-star task in the hopes of cultivating more high-level professionals. Su Yang grasped the rationale behind this guidance. The five-star task presented an extreme challenge. It requires him to take down a boss-level monster without any assistance or the use of equipment received as gifts or trades. Such daunting requirements explain why many opt to steer clear of this path. But still, the allure of gaining 100 spirit attribute points and the opportunity to transition into a demon warrior piqued Su Yang's interest. Not to mention the mysterious temple privileges that accompany the task. These factors solidified his decision to pursue this rigorous path. Meanwhile, the nun really tried her best to convince Su Yang to take the three-star task. Unfortunately for her, he already made up his mind. And so Su Yang just thanked her for the advice. Which made her happy, but even before she could finish her response, and the system chimed in, confirming Su Yang's acceptance of the five-star challenge, her shock was palpable. Her advice eclipsed by his audacity, and all she could do now is ask why the hell he would do such a thing, and Su Yang just confidently replied that it was all on his feelings. He felt that the five-star task was more suitable for him, but before she could say anything more, Su Yang assured her that she doesn't need to worry about him failing. Because he will definitely complete the task, and they should ready the temple since he is very curious about what the temple's privilege hold. I think I have a rough idea of temple privileges. And I think you guys too. Comment down now and let's see how many were correct. After that, he just walked away like a chad and fade away from view. The nun who was paralyzed by disbelief soon snapped back to reality in panic, and then shouted at one of her co-workers. Instructing them to report to the high priest that someone was foolish enough to dare accept a five-star task. And with that, this chapter comes to an end. I hope that you liked today's video, and if you did, hit that like button as today and part 2 down below for the next part. Also, consider subscribing with the notification bell on to get notified as soon as a new video drops onto the channel. See you in the next video. Until then, thanks for watching.